Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Effective Executive by Peter F. Drucker, the definitive guide to getting the right things done. An executive is someone responsible for contribution that materially affects the capacity of an organization to perform and obtain results, which is a long-winded way of just saying someone who works in a job. And uh, effective is getting the right things done. So this is a, a 1967 classic, and I think if anything's relevant 55 years after when it was written, then there's something to it. Absolutely. It gets a bit of Lindy about it. This one, it's uh, Drucker is the absolute man. He gets called up all the time when it comes to who is the father of management guruism. Don't know how many people have called him that, but... <laughs> But anyway, he's a big dog and he's got some good stuff here to teach us about uh, effectiveness because we need effective executives more than ever. We live in a different era than uh, than what even Peter did at the time when he wrote it. Yeah, if you think about 100, 150 years ago, there was mostly manual workers. So a lot of people were doing things using their physical capabilities to get stuff done. And when you're doing uh, physical manual work, then really the only measure of productivity is efficiency. So it's how you've got a specific task, you can only do it this way, how quickly can you get it done and move on to the next thing? Yeah, if you're a manual worker, um, you've got a pretty like a pretty easy way to measure what your output is. If you're going out there and making t-shirts or making pairs of shoes, you can actually count the amount of shoes that you produced in one day. Um, and since the Industrial Revolution, these manual efficiencies have been really important and easy to measure for all the manual workers out there. So in the past, the manual workers, they were like the frontline soldiers. We needed a heap of those and we only needed just a very few uh, generals at the back who were sort of coordinating things. So you needed only a couple of very effective people who were out there dictating the orders and then a whole bunch of people to physically get their hands dirty and do the work. Now, that was in the past, whereas today... Not many people are left in that manual work anymore. Most of us are now in knowledge work. We're not using our hands and our muscles. We're generally using our brains. So when everyone and almost everyone is a knowledge worker, pretty much everyone needs to go out there and learn to be effective, just like the old generals were back in the day dictating what the troops are doing. The issue is the knowledge worker today you can't really be supervised like a manual worker can. If you're working in a factory in a division, you can easily see when someone's just sitting on their ass and doing nothing. It's a bit harder. I think even in the office to say, hey, that person's just been browsing around all day on, um, you know, 9 MSN News or something. Probably even a step harder than that, like the, the shift to working from home. No one can see whatsoever what you're doing. The only thing that people can see is actually how effective you are and the results that come from your performance. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to monitor. It's hard to manage. It's hard to see what's going on. Uh, whereas in the past, it was all about efficiency, doing things right, doing things as quickly as possible. Now, the thing that contributes most to results is effectiveness, which is doing the right things. It doesn't matter how much crap you crank out. It only matters that you crank out important uh, things, the right things. To be reasonably effective, it doesn't matter if you're intelligent or working hard or you're knowledgeable in your industry and you've got the specific knowledge. This is something entirely different. You can be a dumbass. If your IQ is 80, um, you could kick the ass out of someone whose IQ is 150 if you're doing the right thing and choosing effectiveness. Drucker is uh, he's pretty cutting. He doesn't mind giving a whack every now and then. He's, he's pretty harsh. He says, there seems to be very little correlation between a worker's effectiveness and their intelligence, imagination, or knowledge because he says that brilliant people are often strikingly ineffectual at work and they fail to realize that brilliant insight itself is not an achievement. They've never learned that insights become effective only through hard systematic work. So intelligence, imagination, and knowledgeable are essential resources. They're good things to have, but if you're not effective, you're not going to convert these lovely ingredients that you've got into a beautiful set of results. So to be effective, it doesn't require special gifts or training. It's something that you can learn. And in this episode, that's what we're going to be teaching is some of the tools that he's got and the very simple things for us to do and simple habits. The simple thing is, though, they're not inborn. It's something that we can start applying and learn today. Yeah, he says across his four and a half decades of studying management, he's never found a natural in any organization, any organization, large or small, business or government, uh, labor unions, hospitals, universities, uh, communication services across every country in the world. He didn't find any natural effective people. He said that the people that were effective, they were all the ones who had actually worked at it. They'd worked at these five practices and developed their skills. So in this episode, we're going to look at the five 
different practices that make you an effective executive, they're going to transform the results that you get from your work. So uh, we, there's so much we can learn from Drucker. The first habit is know where your time goes. The second, focus on outward contribution. Third, build on strengths, not weaknesses. Fourth, first things first. And number five, making effective decisions. So whatever level you're at, the only thing that really dictates your success in your career, in your work, in your business is effectiveness. And these five habits, they can be learned. And in fact, if you want to achieve any level of career or personal success, they must be learned. The output limits of any process are set by the scarcest resource. In the process that we call accomplishment, the scarcest resource is time. So effective executives know that time is their limiting factor. It's also a unique resource. If you think about money, it's actually quite plentiful. There's loads of it around the world that you can tap into in different ways. With people, you can hire them, you can fire them, you can bring in uh, people if the old ones are no good, um, you can add additional staff, different sorts of skills if the workload's too high. But time, it's something you can't rent, hire, buy, or no one in the world can go out there and obtain more time. Yeah, the supply of time is totally inelastic. No matter how high the demand for time is, the supply is never going to go up. Uh, there's no price curve. There's no marginal utility curve. It's like like for the other economic resources, time is just time. It's fixed. So the executives out there, they don't start with you know what's their to-do lists and uh, managing their workload like that. They always start with managing their time. And before they even start planning where their time, what they're going to do with their time, the first thing they start doing is finding out exactly where their time goes. Now, there are constant pressures towards unproductive and wasteful uses of time uh, and really that's only going up. The time demands on any executive is going up. Whether you're a manager, whether you're a non-manager, a whole bunch of the stuff you're doing is actually going to be crap. You're going to be doing stuff that doesn't actually contribute any results or any achievement and most of your time is going to be wasted. Yeah, back in the day before you took your laptops home and you worked from home, you'd probably get into the office at nine, start hammering away at work, five o'clock, you go home and that's it. Very different. Um, work's sort of encroaching into every, every space throughout your week. So what you do with this time is super critical. The first thing you need to do is time diagnosis. You need to know where your time is going. You need to know what you're doing. Uh, there's so many different... Uh, time management techniques, you know, productivity hacks around the world where you think about uh, all these different ways where you can hack to get the most out of any time. But really, the first thing you got to do before all of that is to actually know where your time is going in the first place. Yeah, this is probably a common thread throughout all sort of habit change books. It's like uh, same with, um, I think it was a Tiny Habits Hash Show where uh, if you want to change what your habits are throughout the day, you need some time actually diagnosing exactly what you're doing throughout the day because... Uh, I think a a lot of people will be surprised as soon as you start getting into your day, you go into this autopilot mode and you just start doing things. It's very hard to know exactly how you spend your time throughout the day if you're not recording it. Yeah, the important thing about this is to actually do it at the time when you're doing it. So don't don't go back at the end of the week and say, oh yeah, on Monday I spent two hours on, on this report and then on Tuesday I spent three and a half hours writing up this proposal because I'm sure that three and a half hours is probably 90 minutes of work and two hours of wasted time. So you actually have to, as you're going, record what you're doing. You know, the, whether that's the, the phone call from the boss that chews up 17 minutes or whether that's the, the meeting that probably could have been 20 that got pushed out to 35 minutes. You've got to work out where is your time actually going. Now, step two is manage time and that's pruning all the time wasters. So you've up until this point, you recorded it. You know exactly where all your time's going throughout the week and this is where the fun happens. So you start hunting down all the non-productive time wasters and of course, snipping them out of your week and getting rid of them. There's a few ways we can do this. Um, a few questions we need to ask ourselves to work out if something is a, is a time waster or not. The first question is, what would happen if this were not done at all? And if the answer to that is nothing, then that's a time waste. You probably got to scrap that. If you, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and this is another Drucker whack. He says it's pretty amazing how many things busy people are doing that will never be missed. If you think about the 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 coffee catch up that you think you have to go on, or whether that's the the daily update to the figures, or whether that's that monthly report that you fill out, you spend hours on, but nobody ever reads. If you ask yourself what's going to happen if this doesn't get done, if the answer is nothing's going to get done, nobody misses it, then you got to scrap that altogether. Yeah, that's it. I'm sure there's 50% of meetings out there could have just been oh, yeah. consolidated into maybe just an email. Yeah. You say, ask the specific person, then all of a sudden you've got eight people in the room and 
Yeah, and a lot of the time, retrospectively, you're like, what, what the hell just happened? Was that just an entire waste of time? And probably is yeah, most of the time. A lot, a lot of the time it is. Another question to ask yourself is, which of my activities could be done by somebody else just as well, if not better? And that's where that crucial skill of an effective executive comes in of delegation. If you realize that the, the thing that you think is so important that you're doing that only you could do, but then you realize, oh, actually, uh, Johnny from uh, from the next block over could probably do this just as well, then maybe give it to Johnny, I reckon. Yeah, that's it. Naval Ravikant in his, well, not in his book, but the Almanac, uh, Almanac of Naval does talk about leverage and how important this is um, in the modern world because... Uh, delegating and leadership in that sense is an ultimate form of leverage where you can actually multiply your output by a great deal if you're able to delegate effectively to other people of the team. Uh, if you think about that you're sacrificing some of your work by giving it to somebody else and you're thinking about it all wrong, you've got to realize that once you've got this list of all this crap that you're doing and realize that, well, look, some of it doesn't need to be done so you can scratch that off entirely, you're still going to have a long list. If you can realize that there's three other people in the team that you can delegate tasks to, that your special insight doesn't actually add anything specific, then it's better to get them to do that to free yourself up to do the more important stuff. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's the big handball. Like having the effective handball is one of the most important skills of these effective executives. Now, number three, the third question, ask yourself, what do I do that wastes the time of others without contributing to their effectiveness? Be yeah. selfless here. Yeah, the first couple, we, we, were, we were pruning out our own time wasters. Now, we're pruning out the time of others that we're wasting as well. Um, and there's probably a lot of these. There's probably the... Uh, you know, the, the weekly whip with your team members where everybody shares what they've been up to, but nobody really gives a, gives a stuff about what's going on. Maybe it wastes 45 minutes of everybody's time. Whereas you say, maybe you can scrap that and it's just a, a three bullet point email where everybody emails in what they're up to. That's just saved six people, 45 minutes time each. So step one was record time. Step two was manage time. Now, step three is consolidate time. So once you've logged your time in step one, you've pruned your, your time wasters in step two, your coffee with your coffees with all the suppliers and all that sort of stuff that just makes no sense. You're getting rid of all that. You're going to find that there might be a little bit, bit of time that's left over if you've done step one and two correctly. Now, the important thing here is we consolidate this spare time uh, into as big a chunk as possible because anything that's really effective, anything that's really important it's probably going to take a long time to do. You can't just fill in 12 minutes here, 9 minutes there, 17 minutes there. You've got to actually try and get as much of these chunks of time together as possible so you can actually sit down, focus, do some deep work to actually contribute and achieve something big. This, for me personally, was by far the biggest takeaway from the book. I mean, if someone's scheduling meetings, say, hey, when are you available for it? Previously, if you got a full day on a Friday, I'd probably say, hey, I'm available Thursday and Friday all day. But now it's you know, putting all the meetings back to back on a certain day, then all of a sudden you've got a, a full day perhaps to get actually work done. So yeah, having these long chunks of time to get important tasks done is uh, is all about the consolidation. Yeah, there might be a few um, there might be a few specific things you do here to try to get as big a free chunk of time as possible. It might be that you work from home one day a week where you say, if you don't have to, don't call me because I'm going to be focusing on these really important things. Maybe it's writing that report. Maybe that's uh, preparing the big pitch or the big presentation where you need focus and time. But maybe it's a rule saying no meetings before 11 a.m. and give yourself two to three hours every morning of dedicated work time before you get sucked into meetings. Yeah, you know, I was speaking to someone recently and they were saying in, in the meeting, like, oh, yeah, uh, I was just laughing with my partner because it's taken me a full day to write this email as if, um, you know, but and that's not a very effective executive. <laughs> effective executive would have perhaps consolidated time, chunked all the things properly and at least made themselves able to make one I'm email. Sure, I'm sure they it probably did take all day, but they probably did six minutes here and then they were off doing something else and they came back and did another 12 minutes here and then they came back and every time they're kind of starting from scratch again. Whereas if you just had have said, okay, I'm going to set aside an hour to do this all in one hit, it would have been done. Absolutely. Because most of the big things that you do, they do require a whole chunk of time to get your first zero draft. I mean, if you're um, writing a whole draft or something or you're preparing a pitch or a presentation, if you're, if you're doing it in dribs and drabs, it'll never get done. But if you spend five hours to get the first version done, in the dribs and drabs, you can do mm. little tweaks. When you got your 20 minutes before a meeting or something, you can get into it, change the formatting of the first few slides or whatever it might be. 
So as any effective executive knows, they know that managing your time isn't something you do once. It's something you got to do perpetually. And you, as an effective executive, you know that time is the scarcest resource. And until you manage your time, you can't manage anything. Let's say you hop into an elevator and you, uh, someone pops in and they're looking super important in a nice, lovely Navy suit. And you ask what they do and a lot of them will say things like, hey, I run the marketing department or I'm in charge of the sales force or I have 250 staff under me. A lot of these answers are focusing on sort of their downward authority and their position. And that's not what an effective executive would reply. An effective executive asks the question fundamentally, what can I contribute? And their answers will be focused on their contribution to their organization and results and will have nothing to do with their own personal downward authority on people. Too many people are focused downward on their power, on their authority, on their probably on their job title as well, on their rank and status in the organization. Not enough people are focused on uh, results and outward contribution. It doesn't really matter how much effort you put in. What really matters is how much result you are putting out. Effective executives would look up from their work and towards their goals and they ask the questions, hey, what can I contribute that will significantly affect the performance and the results of the institution I serve? They're stressing on responsibility and results. I don't think a lot of people are asking that sort of question. I think the natural instinct, particularly personally, I'm sure it's the same for everyone, is like the immediate thing is like, hey, what can I get out of this? What's this organization can do for me? Very rare that you'll get someone who's actually purely that selfless that the organization is put before them. But if you want to be an effective executive, this is something that you need to do and get going. Yeah, I think a lot of time is spent thinking about how much effort you're putting in, how many hours you're putting in, how much work you're doing. uh, And you're probably just working away without ever thinking, well, what's this work actually achieving? To be an effective executive, you need to sort of pull back from just doing hardcore work, getting down and dirty. And you've got to think, well, what am I actually contributing here? What results am I actually generating? So the second practice of an effective executive is to focus on outward contribution and to always ask, what am I contributing? Contributing. So there's three major areas of performance of an organization. Firstly, it's direct results and this comes first. You want shit to go good. In business, it might be your product sales. In hospitals, it might be patients care. So without the results, you probably don't have a successful organization whatsoever. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty obvious one. You need to make sure that your work is always contributing to some kind of direct result, something that actually is, is of tangible benefit and importance. There's also some things that you can do that aren't directly related to results but are in a roundabout sort of a way. One might be building values. So whilst there's the actual work getting done, there's also the things that you need to build to say, look, what does this organization stand for uh, and how can I contribute to building that team culture? Bit of a sign at Cynic, that one, I think, to start with why. Having a why for an organization, it'll have everyone to have a reason to go for work um, and your organization will be powered on something much more powerful, for the lack of a better word, than <laughs> one that wasn't. Third one, another bit of a cynic banger, uh, building for tomorrow. So in this sense, it would be like having the infinite game mindset as opposed to the finite game mindset and having your boundaries um, extending beyond the horizon. Yeah, the point of the uh, an organization, the point of building a company or a business is to outlive the founder. Uh, and you know, mortality, death, that's going to put a limit on what anyone can contribute. But if you can build an organization or a team or a, or a company, if you can build something that outlives your uh, specific life, then you've done something well. So the critical thing here is in developing people. So obviously, if you're just one person, there's only so much you can do. But if you become someone who can develop other people to do the work around you, it's a huge form of leverage to get better output for your organization. So the executive, they have their sights on contribution and raise the standards and develop the people for everyone who they're working with. So importantly, as an effective executive, you've got to kind of stop worrying about uh, how much you're working, how much effort you're putting in and instead shift your focus to what results are you actually generating and what are you actually contributing. An effective executive knows that you can't build on weakness. If you want to achieve results, then you have to utilize everybody's strengths and build upon those. You need the strengths of your team members, the strength of your bosses, the strengths of your subordinates. You need, of course, your own strengths as well because strengths are the true opportunity. So the third practice of an effective executive is to make strengths productive. So one area as an example that executives have to encounter is staffing. So making strengths productive in this 
case is uh, staffing and filling out the organization based on what a person can do. You don't staff the organization to minimize weaknesses, but to maximize strength. So you're not going to go out there and get these whole all-rounders or the people who are just like you just to fill out the organization because they're pretty good. You might find someone who's extremely good in one area and someone else who complement that person. And with that, through the diversity, you're probably going to add it all together and be a much stronger organization because of it. Yeah, that's right. You want to stack all the strengths together. You don't want to worry about the weaknesses because if you put the right people together in the right ways, you can make those weaknesses irrelevant. You got to realize that strong people are going to also have strong weaknesses. But if you get the right combination going, then you can actually maximize those peaks rather than trying to minimize the valleys. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just, I remember at university, for example, like doing a, a project, there was, I hate writing reports. Luckily, there was someone who I teamed up beautifully because she loves writing reports but hated doing the engineering. So, you know, if you've got a third person who likes doing the presenting, then you've probably got a group mm. where um, you can compensate for each other's weaknesses. And when you're together, you're going to be much, the, the whole is going to be much stronger than the parts. So if, you were, uh, if you're looking to uh, fill a role or if you're looking to hire someone or if you're looking to bring somebody into your team, you shouldn't be asking things like, oh, how do I get along with this person? Or you shouldn't be saying, what can this person not do? All you should be saying is, what can this person do uncommonly well? What's their massive strength that you can bring in and tap into and maximize? You should be finding a, a, a staff member or a team member that has excellent skills in one major area rather than someone who's just like a, an all-rounder who gets by in all areas. 100%. Like someone might be a real pain in the ass in the organization. They come in and they, they stink or they swear and they yell at people and they're an asshole. Um, <laughs> it's maybe me saying you should <laughs> hire them, but Drucker would probably wouldn't hire them actually. But just for the purposes of this, you could probably cop all the other stuff. If they can do one thing extremely well and better than everyone else, you can get over all their other weaknesses and just look at their, their ultimate strengths. And this is what making strengths productive is all about. Another interesting twist here, what Drucker says is, if, you, if you're looking to hire someone, don't start with the job description. Don't start with, you know, what does this job require? What's the, the list of past experiences and, and the, the six skills that this person should have to fill this role? Instead, rather than looking at what the job requires, you should look at what the person can do. So, you should be looking about, okay, where are these strengths and how can you actually build a role around this person's strengths rather than just looking for somebody who can fill the gap with the, the nice pretty resume that has got all the right dot points, but maybe they don't do that massive sort of overachievement in that one area. You'll be doing yourself and the person coming on board and the organization a favor if you make the job description that you're putting together demanding and big and of course as you were saying they are so tailored to who the person is and what their strengths are especially for the people just entering the workforce because um, you'll be doing a huge favor if you show them and let them set huge and high standards because that's going to probably be their anchor for their performance for the rest of their career it does take a fair bit of discipline to always be asking what can this person do rather than saying, what can this person not do? It's pretty easy to identify the flaws and, and realize all the things that somebody's doing wrong, but it takes a lot more discipline to realize that, hey, what can if this person could do this one thing really, really well, then their lacks become secondary. And of course, if you're always looking for the best in other people and not trying to always look for their weaknesses, eventually, you're going to start using this approach on yourself as well. Definitely. If, if, you, know, if you start knowing what you personally can do uncommonly well, you're probably going to try and exploit that and look for opportunities where you're using that in the best way possible. Rather than find yourself in situations where your C or D grade attributes are on show, you want to be in your hitting zone as much as possible really throughout your career. And with that, as you explore and find out what your hitting zone is and you stay in that area, um, you're going to be much more productive and effective yourself. Yeah. So Druck is saying you shouldn't be... Uh admonishing your own weaknesses. You shouldn't be trying to just plug all of your gaps. Instead, you should be finding where are your strengths and trying to maximize those. So rather than just trying to trying to build up your weaknesses, it's actually more productive to focus on building up your strengths. So the third practice of the effective executive is to make strengths productive. If you look at all the productive tasks, the things you can do, plus all the opportunities of the things you can do, you quickly find out that there is a whole bunch more stuff you can do in the world than you've actually got time to accomplish in a single week or in your single lifetime. 
Yeah, there's always more important contributions to be made than there is time available to make them. So basically, for most people, there's more shit to do than you've actually got time for. No matter how well you manage your time, there's still going to be more opportunities than you can possibly ever do. There's always going to be a time deficit. Concentration is absolutely vital for effective executives. As a bit of an analogy, um, humans... We're a bit like a multi-purpose tool. We can do all sorts of stuff, cool stuff. Um, we're a bit like a Swiss army knife in many ways. But if you're using a Swiss army knife, yes, there's 10 things you can do. You can get the knife out. You can get the screwdriver out and the scissors and what else have they got? Scissors and nail file and some of them, yeah. All sorts of cool <laughs> shit in there that I've never used. But uh end of the day, you can't use them all at once, can you? No, not at all. You got to choose one. Um, and that's the trick with the Swiss Army knife. Choose one at a time and then you can use this multi-purpose tool in its best effect. That's right. Drucker says if there's any secret to effectiveness, it's concentration. And an effective executive, they focus on one thing at a time and they do first things first. Now, interestingly, uh, people who get nothing done often work a hell of a lot harder. Uh, they're probably expecting everything to go right. They're thinking, okay, if, if this lines up, then I'll be able to smash this all out in one hit. But often there's always things that go wrong. They also try to hurry and they think that speed is the key to achieving a whole bunch of things. They rush a whole bunch of stuff. They multitask. They do all these things at once. But then in the end, really, it's actually the, uh, the effective executive, more of the tortoise than the hare. The effective executive, they pick one thing to do at once. They set a steady pace. They work consistently and they actually achieve a hell of a lot more. Yeah, our pal earlier who we were talking about who spent half a day to write an email and it never got done, there's no doubt that they're working really hard, probably mm. harder than anyone. They're putting more time into it, but really where they would be falling down is I'm sure they had nine different tasks mm. set for the morning, different phone calls, meetings here, and they couldn't just use that, get the Swiss Army knife out and just cut the one piece of paper <laughs> and then pull the screwdriver out to, to hammer the screw in. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy, Mate, you're obviously not really much of a handy man. <laughs> I knew I, I knew what was coming out of my mouth as I said it. Anyway, uh, so that's really the key. The key is to just like pick one thing at a time to focus on, and also to put first things first. Uh, now, interestingly, Drucker says is uh, you should not only set a list of priorities, but you should also set a list of posteriorities. So you've got your to do list, but you should also have your not to do list. Yeah, priorities are easy. Everybody can do it. It's the most talked about word in a, you know a lot of organizations, but very few executives talk about the, these posteriorities, the, the not-to-do list because if you think about it, our time suckers, um, it might be your social media, whatever personal thing you're pulled to, that's probably going to be the one thing that stops you from doing work. It might be taking phone calls, whatever it might be. If you define your not-to-do list, your time's going to be much more safeguarded and your concentration to get those first priorities completed. Yeah, I think it goes I think it goes beyond the obvious time sucks as well. I think there's plenty of stuff that people do that doesn't need to be done all the way back in uh, the first practice. You got to realize that, you know, maybe you've got that every month you do that report that nobody reads. Maybe you can whack that on your not to do list. If people aren't going to miss it, maybe you just saved yourself 3 hours on the first day of each month that you can take away from that posteriority, the not to do list and focus on something that is actually truly important instead. So in summary here, concentration is vitally important. Another great book on this to just to explore this a bit further, an episode we're done would be Deep Work by Cal Newport. So this is critical for knowledge workers today. So the effective executive, they commit themselves to one task to concentrate on right now and they don't go with this scattergun approach and just like do the piecewise concentration on 100 different tasks at the same time. So it takes courage here really to impose on the events and the outward things trying to encroach on you to decide what really matters and only do that. Making decisions is something that generally doesn't take a hell of a lot of time but is absolutely vitally important. And it's also uh, the only task that is unique to an effective executive. If, if you think about the manual worker, they weren't making decisions, they were just given orders to follow. If you think about somebody pretty low down on the food chain of knowledge work, they're also just given orders to follow. They're just given directions of what to do. But the higher up you go, uh, the more important it becomes to make effective decisions. So effective executives, they make effective decisions and they don't just do it willy-nilly. They actually follow a systematic process with clearly defined elements made in a distinct sequence of steps. So 
it's pretty different to what you know a lot of other people would um, say the elements of decision making. Drucker probably tackles it in quite a different way, I'd say. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is a bit eye opening. I reckon that he really said that there's only really two uh, things that we need to work out. We need to work out is this a generic problem or is this an exception. If it's a generic problem, then it requires a generic solution. It's something that's been done before. And if it's an exception, then obviously it needs a specific exception that is treated on a case-by-case basis. So truly understanding and diagnosing what the problem is is super important for you to jump in and just shoot from the hip and make your, make your decision. So there's four different types of problems. The first type is truly a generic problem. So this is just something that it comes up as an individual occurrence, but in reality, it's a generic problem that happens all the time. Yeah, if you think about maybe you're in a warehouse or a factory and you've got inventory problems, there's inventory uh, shortages or surpluses. This is not a new problem. This is just a symptom of a generic recurring problem. It's something that's going to happen all the time. If you were to treat this as an individual exception, as a one-off problem, the inventory control, they're going to go around fighting fires. They're going to fight 100 different fires every month and try to solve every little problem that pops up but really they should probably just take a step back and say hang on if this is happening all the time maybe i need some kind of rule or principle that's going to stop this from occurring in future if it's a generic problem it needs a generic solution that's it if you got the rule developed this one time you can just roll the rule out for when it pops up a hundred other times and with that one decision it has the ripple effect to solve all the other issues eh? definitely the second type of problem is something that looks like an exception, but actually it's a generic problem. So it's something that is going to look unique to you as an individual, but it happens all the time. So for example, uh, a merger or acquisition, a company approaches you and says, hey, we want to buy you. Now to you, that's going to be the first and probably only time you ever get that if you sell. It's going to seem like an exceptional problem, but actually that's something that happens all the time. So in order to solve this problem, you just need to sort of look outside of your bubble, look to other people that have done it before, you know, look to books, look to case studies, look to, uh, you know, courses, look to gurus, look to anybody uh, who's done it before and say, okay, here's this generic problem. It seems unique to me, but what, what would you suggest? How can I solve it? How has it been solved well in the past? You're really getting the outside view using Daniel Kahneman terminology to help you make the decision here. The third category is where it's an exception. But it's really the first manifestation of a whole new generic problem that's going to arise in the future. Yeah, if you think about the the first time uh, electricity came along and everybody's got access to power and then there was a blackout. The first time that happened, everyone would have thought, holy shit, this is a brand new thing that's never happened before. We've got a blackout. How can we solve this? But actually, it's a new generic problem. So it, it happened once, but actually, it's going to keep happening again. So in this case, if it's something that you could foresee happening again in the future, then you need to find a generic solution again, get that rule in place. Now, the fourth bucket is truly the exceptional problem, bit of a black swan. It's entirely rare. There's no way that you could have guessed this was going to happen. It's probably never going to happen again. Um, But, you know, this hardly ever happens. So, what Drucker says, pretty much every time, every issue you have, it's going to fall in those first three buckets where you can develop systematic processes and rules to deal with it. So, next time it comes up again, you can handle it. Or alternatively, you can borrow from someone else who's developed the generic rules to help you with the situation. So either way, whenever something happens, you're looking for, for those systematic processes to uh, as, as your problem-solving uh, mechanism. That's right. The completely ineffective way to do it is every time there's a problem, you think, what's a problem? How can I solve this one uh, individual exception, this one problem that pops up? How can I whack a Band-Aid on it? But really, the effective executive, they make these uh, generic decisions where they put the rules or processes in place so that, again, next time it pops up, they've got a rule they can go back to, or even better, if you can solve it and stop it from happening in the first place. Let's say if you're a startup, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, and you got a shortage of cash. might be the first time that you've had this issue, mm. but it's obviously something that's happened elsewhere. So you go through the buckets and you can make a decision, hey, what the hell are we going to do with in this moment? Most people probably just shoot from the hip and just try and flander around and figure it out, but that's not an effective way of doing it. You'd find out what bucket you'd be in, and mm. in this case, what bucket would you be in, Ashto? 
Well, you might think, oh, this is a true exception. This has never happened before. It's never going to happen again. And then you just think, oh, how can I get a new investor or take out a big loan and solve my cash problem? But that's not very effective. The effective executive is going to realize, well, hang on, why are we running out of cash? Uh, there's a few things that it could fall into. Uh, it's something that other companies face all the time. So you could go for that, you know, the. It seems unique to you, but it's actually generic. That second bucket where you actually, you know, ask a few friends, ask around for other startups. What have you done? Uh, how have you found it? Or it could be the first mutation for you of a brand new generic problem. So that would be looking at, at bucket C. That might be thinking, okay, well, how come we're running out of cash? Is this something that's likely to happen again? Rather than just going the band-aid solution and getting more cash, maybe you should think, well, our costs are too high. How can we bring our costs down so it doesn't happen again in future? So it's a huge leverage moment when you face these situations because once you hit the core of what the issue is and you create rules and how you're going to face the issues in the future, that one decision you might make, you might block out three or four hours. It might seem a bit over the top how you're handling this one situation to make the decision. However, it's a huge leverage moment because you're going to save a lot more time and your outputs and effectiveness is going to be a lot higher um, you know, forward-looking. So that's, uh, that's the, the best thing you can do is always look for that generic answer to that problem. So as you say, saving time in the future. But there's also one final question in this decision-making process before you take action. Is the decision really necessary at all? Yeah, sometimes it might look like a decision needs to be made. But there's also the alternative of just doing nothing. That's also something that needs to get included in your cost-benefit analysis of weighing up all the alternative options that you could be choosing from. Doing nothing sometimes uh, outweighs the, the costs and the risks of doing something. And now the most important part of any decision is act or do not act. Don't hedge, don't compromise, don't try to get a few fingers in all different pies, don't try a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You need uh, the conviction and the courage to make your decision and stick to it. He says that uh, the ineffective executive is the one who says, okay, let's do another study, let's get some more data, let's do some more research into this. Eventually, you need to get to the point where you make a decision. He says that's the trying to get more information is often the coward's way out and and he says that all that cowards achieve is to die a thousand deaths when the brave man dies but one. The premise of this book rests on two core ideas. The executive's job is to be effective and get results and outputs. Now, the second premise is effectiveness and can be learned. It's something we, we went through five habits in this episode. You can throw them in your back pocket, in your toolbox, and you're going to be a much better operator going forward. Above all, what this all boils down to is self-development. As Drucker said at the start, there's no naturally effective people. It's all a process of learning, developing, and practicing. And when you're focusing on the self and you know, putting yourself up a few notches to become effective, you're not just going to raise the performance of yourself, but the whole organization is going to benefit from it. You're going to raise the sights of the people around you, and it's going to have a ripple effect on all the people in your organization also. So Drucker says that by going through these five practices of effectiveness, then effectiveness can be learned. And if you have any desire to achieve anything of, of career or personal success, then effectiveness must be learned. Mm-hmm.